listening to today's Community Cast. My name is Matt Morgan. I'm the pastor at Community Brookside, a new church plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are so blessed by your presence, and we hope that today's content will bring you joy. So before we get going too far this morning, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, this sermon series, yes, is about the United Methodist membership vows. And I know that not everybody in this place is a member of our church or a member of the United Methodist Church yet. But this sermon series is geared to help you understand what I hope you're willing to get yourselves into, okay? So with that being said, we're gonna talk about uh, the membership vow today of service. So there are five things in the United Methodist Church that we believe that all of us should commit to When we become members of the church, we should commit to loving the church and supporting the church through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. So let me be clear. When we talk about those five membership vows, um, it wasn't until like 2008 that we added witness. Prayers, presence, gifts, and service has been the United Methodist vows since 1968. And then in like 2008, we decided, hey, we should also live out these things, right? Like I just find that a little humorous. But today, as we talk about our membership vows and what they mean for us as Christians, please know that there's no expectation that as soon as you join the church, you're now going to have to go teach a third grade Sunday school class, okay? We would like that. There's no expectation, no obligation there. We don't expect that you're going to immediately, once you join the church, go on a mission trip somewhere to like Guatemala or Tonga or someplace that's been hurt or devastated recently. There's, there are other things that God is calling us to be a part of. There are other ways that we can serve as well. In this series, we're working towards preparing every one of us who call ourselves both Christians and Methodist Christians to better serve God with all of ourselves. So today, we're looking at what it means to be in service to God. Another of the vows that we as United Methodists take when we join in the uh, United Methodist congregation is that we will support the church, both the global church, meaning not just the United Methodist Church, but the church God's move in the earth, and our local congregation through the way that we serve. So what does it mean to you to serve others? What does it look like to you? Is there a visual that pops into your head of what it looks like to serve anybody? Okay, so, so I've got a visual here that's really, that's really sweet, right? A little young woman who's assisting an elderly woman probably across the street, right? Like that's one way to serve. Now, initially, I had a graphic in here of foot washing. And I was like, hey, Gage, give me some feedback. And he's like, nope, don't do feet stuff. And so... <laughs> Got it, got it, okay, message received. But that was like one of the strongest visuals I could think of of what it means to serve others. Doing something that we detest in order to put others ahead of ourselves. Like that is the ultimate idea of service to me. Like, let me be very clear. I have done the foot washing services in the past in other churches that I've been a part of and it makes me so uncomfortable. Can I get an amen? Okay, so lots of people, right? So feet, feet are just weird. Um, but that was what Jesus did to set the example for what true love looks like. It's washing the, the most disgusting part of the human body. So what does service look like to you? What is something that you see as a service to other people? Anybody? Anybody? So it's finding out needs first and then finding a way to meet those needs. That's perfect. Is there a difference between what serving looks like as a Christian versus somebody who's not a Christian? Does it look different? Should it look different? Yeah, I got some head shaking. No, I think, I think the way that we serve, I think, is, is um, we should definitely represent why we serve it's because we serve God and we love God right that should always be a part of why we serve but we should do the same thing that the world needs us to do like meeting the needs of things that we that we find right so there are organizations in the world who are not Christian who 
help the homeless and help unwed mothers and help with divorces and help with, you know, all the things that the Christian church does, they do it too. But we do it because God does it for us, right? So think about it. In what ways recently have you served somebody around you? Is maybe there somebody at work that you've helped uh, through a hard time? Maybe you have helped a neighbor. Maybe you have walked a sweet little old lady across the street. Maybe you have washed somebody's feet. I don't know. What have you done recently for somebody else? Okay, so now that you've thought about that for a second, can you do better? I think the answer for all of us is, yeah, I think we can all do a little bit better, right? And if we really want to follow Jesus fully, we have to do better. The United Methodist Church asks us when we join a Methodist congregation to support our church and our denomination through acts of service. Service is another piece of what we're called to do by Jesus in order to show the world that God loves the world. We become God's representatives on earth, expressing love and meeting the needs of others around us. Serving others is about putting our own needs and our own desires aside in order to bring help to somebody else. So when I'm looking through scripture, one of the greatest examples of what service really looks like comes to us from a letter from the Apostle Paul. And that letter is the letter of Philippians. It was written by Paul to the church at Philippi. And here's what it says in Philippians 2, 1 through 5. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there with me. If you don't, it'll be on the screen as well. Here's what it says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And here's where I want you to focus in. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So here, Paul is telling us that we have to put others first. We have to be humble. Sometimes it's really hard for us to be humble, isn't it, right? We have to have the same mindset of Jesus. And let's think about what Jesus' mindset was. Jesus shared full divinity with God, right? He had this, this place in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. And then he decided, you know what? In order to save humanity, I'm going to show up in this mortal vessel, this human body, and I'm going to change what love looks like. He gave up his divinity in heaven to be God-man here on earth with us. So that's the example that we have to follow. Now, let's be clear. None of us are divine. But we have to give up our own wants, our own needs, sometimes our own position, our own power, our own dollars in some cases, in order to serve others the way they need to be served. Jesus put aside everything he had for a bunch of sinners like us. The vows we take to become Methodist Christians are based on the idea that all people are valuable to God. And we should humble ourselves and make sure that other people, those who are valuable in God's eyes, are taken care of. Remember last week we talked about gifts. Oh, I just heard a bunch of wax roll down on the table. I was, thought we had a leak. Um, so last week we talked about gifts. And today we're talking about how we use the gifts that we have to do something for the kingdom of God. We use our gifts in the service of God and others. What's great about this church, or sorry, this letter to the church at Philippi, is that it says a lot more to us if we actually begin to read between the lines. Sometimes I find that a lot can be said without actually saying something, right? Right? For instance, when we read this, how 
often does Paul talk to the church and tell them that they need to be humble? Does he say you need to be humble once a week? Does he say you need to be humble once a month maybe? Listen, you need to be humble at least once a day. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't give us a timeline. So by not giving us a timeline, the inference is that at all times we're supposed to be humble. Does Paul tell us exactly who it is that we need to raise above ourselves? Does he tell us that it has to be somebody who uh, is of a specific racial group? Does he talk about different attributes that people have in order for us to lift them up? Does he talk about a specific subset of people? Do they have to be black people or brown people or white people? No, he doesn't give us any sort of breakdown. So when he doesn't tell us any specifics, he says, now we have to be humble always and we have to raise up all people. When Paul doesn't give specifics, he doesn't feel like he has to. He's counting on us to apply his teaching to every person we meet. Every single person. I've had some really interesting um, interactions in Brookside, right? Because Brookside, I think, is a very special place. It's very eclectic. We have people that come in all over from Tulsa to come shop and eat and play here in Brookside. But what, what I think we miss a lot of is that there is still brokenness in this community. You guys might remember me talking about um, homeless people that have lived in our elevator. We've dealt with homeless people who have um, set up like kind of temporary housing in our play equipment out in the park. And sometimes we have to remember that God is calling us to serve even people who a lot of people would look at and think they're less than. Those are the people that, that Paul is telling us that we have to humble ourselves to serve the most. And sometimes it's so hard because they don't look like us. They don't have the same education as us. They certainly don't smell like us. They don't have the privileges that we have. And so we're supposed to humble ourselves and lift them up and put them in front of ourselves. And that's really awkward sometimes. But that's a little piece of what we're called to be as Christians. People who serve the least. All people, all the time, are to be lifted up and honored because of our faith in Jesus. So if we go back just a little bit before the time of Paul, actually even still during the time of Paul, we can recognize that not every person used to be considered worthy enough to be loved or served. There was a time when serving others meant that we only served people who were like us. Serving others was only serving people who shared the same heritage, the same language, the same traditions, the same faith. Serving others looked very different than I feel like Jesus called us to serve. So we've talked in here about how the Jewish people have always thought that they were chosen by God, right? That's something that is scriptural. Uh, the, the Jews believed that God had called them and set them apart to be a priesthood among the nations. God called them to be his voice on earth to all people. But if you wanted to join in, you had to, like there were some rules you had to follow, right? Circumcision, dietary laws, things like that, how you worship. Those were all requirements in order to serve God correctly and worship God right and be a part of his, his gathered kingdom, right? And history proves this to be somewhat true. History tells us that the Jewish people are special because it was through a Jewish family that we received Jesus, Right? It was a Jewish bloodline through which God chose to make himself manifest. So it, there is some truth in that. The, the Jewish people are a chosen people. But because of this self-imposed importance that the Jews felt, they refused to fully participate with other cultures, sometimes taking this national cultural pride a little bit too far. Sometimes the Jewish people were so fearful of cross-cultural contamination, they were so fearful that their purity would be taken away from them if they intermingled with other people, with other faiths, with other traditions, with other uh, you know, nationalities. 
that sometimes the Jews missed helping people when they were hurting. They felt they needed to remain pure at all costs, even if that meant they had to allow other people to suffer in order to maintain their special relationship with God. And when Jesus came to live among the Jewish people, he knew that that had to be shifted. So every chance that Jesus got, Jesus pushed people to open their hearts and open their minds to those who needed help, even if they were outside the Jewish community. One of my favorite parables ever we're going to look at today, and we've looked at it before, but I want to look at it again because it's important for us. You can find it in the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. You've heard it in here before. You're going to hear it probably a million more times because this is one of my favorite scriptures of all time. Here's how it starts for us today in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, and I imagine it was relatively smug. Teacher, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Uh, sorry, what is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? Well, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who, uh, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road. And when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, <clears throat> as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. All right, so here's where I need some involvement. What sticks out to you when we read this parable? What do you like about this story, right? The righteous were, what sticks out to me is the righteous were the ones that avoided the yeah. The righteous are the ones who not, not only just avoided, but they walked on the other side of the road to completely avoid the person who's hurting. Do we know why? Right? So this goes back to the, the, the Puritan, or not the Puritan, but the, the purity laws of the Hebrews. They cannot touch somebody who is bleeding. Can't do it. Otherwise, you have to go and present yourself to the priest. You have to cleanse yourself. And there's a whole series of things you have to do in order to make yourself righteous again so you can go worship in the temple. So these guys who were coming by, they were who? A priest and a, a Levite. So a priest is somebody who is uh, reading the Torah in the temple. And a Levite is somebody who does all the sacrifices and all the taking of the alms and all those other kind of temple rituals. So these people were employed basically by the church and they couldn't get themselves dirty. Do you know how much urine I've had to clean up <laughs> in our elevator? You know what I mean? I literally had to remove human excrement from the play equipment outside because homeless people were making it a place where they could survive. And it's gross. I don't like doing it. But we have to, right? Sometimes we're going to be called to help somebody in desperate need, even if it means we have to give up some things about ourselves. Even if that means we get a little bit dirty in the process, we have to do those things. What are some other things that, that you like about this story? We got the guys who, you know, the priests and the, the Levite, they go around the other side. What are some other things that you like about this parable that Jesus tells? Who is Jesus talking to when he tells the story? 
Who, who challenges him? A lawyer, or lawyer, a law expert, right? So how does Jesus address him? What does Jesus say? The man asks Jesus a question. Well, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus responds, and his words are, can we pull that up there on the screen? Uh, I think it's verse, I don't know, one of the first few verses. 26. What does Jesus say? Nope, one before that. Jesus responds by saying, what is written in the law, right? I think it's pretty clear that Jesus knows who's addressing him, right? It's a teacher of the law, and Jesus says, what does your knowledge tell you? What does the, you know, what you've studied, what do you know? It obviously should play a role in how you answer this own question. I think that's pretty crazy. Jesus tells him to reflect on what he knows, what he's been trained in. He doesn't say, well, you know, what does poetry tell you? That would have made no sense to him. What does the law say? And so he's able to regurgitate what he knows about the truth of God. He knows the scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is called the Shema, right? This is ancient Hebrew truth for them. This is one of the most important things. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. From the ancient of times, right, where, where God is revealing himself to his people, you know, in this new community. And God tells them, love me. Love me with all that you have. It says that in the scripture, the man wanted to justify himself. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to justify yourself? Make excuses? Make excuses? That's, a, that's a good one. Here's, here's my mind, right? So again, we're talking a lot about being humble. Lawyers are sometimes people who may not be the most humble. So he says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what do you know? What, is, what does your profession tell you about it? Reading the law of God, what does it mean? And he says, well, do these things, obviously. But then it says he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to make sure that everybody knew he knew what he was talking about. Well, even if I ask you that, Jesus, I really do know. So just, I need some clarity in the law. Can you just clarify for me? Just one, one simple thing, a little, little thing. Who's my neighbor, right? It's a good thing we have 2,000 years of reading the scripture so we actually know who our neighbor is considered to be. Because otherwise, we're looking like, in the literal sense, who our neighbors are. Do you guys know your neighbors? Do you like your neighbors? That's good. I have some neighbors that I love, and I have some neighbors that I love a lot less, right? But Jesus isn't calling us in this moment to love our neighbors, the people who live physically next door to us, He's calling on us to grow our definition of neighbor. The crazy thing about this story is that I bet we already know in this room that Samaritans and Jews didn't get along pretty well, right? Like you've heard that before. We've talked about that before. We'll talk about it again. We've talked about how Israel was overrun a number of times by people. Uh, and in this instance, the Assyrian Empire took over the northern kingdom of Israel in the year 722. And because of this, there was a lot of intermarrying between Assyrians and northern kingdom Jews. And it caused a lot of issues in their faith because sometimes they began to worship uh, in ways that were weird. They set up um, high places, right? So places of worship in Dan in the north and Bethel in the south. And they began to go there to present sacrifices in a weird way to maybe a deity that kind of resembled uh, Yahweh, but not quite. And they were, they were taking parts and pieces of Assyrian religion and Jewish tradition and faith and religion and mixing them together. And so the Jews who remained in Jerusalem in the southern part of the kingdom of Judah despised this kind of mixed race people that became Jews from the north. And they called these people Samaritans. And that's what makes this, this parable of Jesus so powerful. 
It's that the, the Jewish people who have been trained their whole lives not to associate with Samaritans, not to touch people who are ill or, or dirty or bloody. Jesus says, no, 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 no. The way that you've been taught is not quite right. Your neighbor is the person you despise. It's the person who's dirty, who's uh, a mudblood, who is, you know, a mixed race of people, somebody who doesn't quite get who God is yet. Those are the people you're still su supposed to serve. It's the people that you hate are the ones you're supposed to serve. Jesus took a look at the leaders in Israel and he tells them that taking care of themselves and the people that looked like them was no longer enough. They were going to take, have to take care of people who didn't look like them, who didn't act like them, who didn't believe the same as them, who didn't grow up with the same traditions and faith as them. Jesus was calling all of Israel to a new life of service, a type of service that had been neglected in the past. And this new type of Christian service was going to change the whole world. In my opinion, this parable is one of the most powerful in all of Scripture. Jesus uses it to say, yes, everyone is our neighbor. And there's more, right? Right? So Jesus impresses upon his followers one of the greatest stories of service ever when Jesus sets an example for us what service really looks like. And we can find that in the story of the night before Jesus was murdered when he spends time eating dinner with his best friends. John chapter 13, verses 10 through 17 says this. <clears throat> Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his dear companions, he continued to love them right to the end. It was supper time. The devil by now had Judas, son of Simon, the Iscariot, firmly in his grip, all set for the betrayal. Jesus knew that the Father had put him in complete charge of everything, that he came from God and was on his way back to God. So he got up from the dinner table, he set aside his robe, and he put on an apron. Then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. When he got to Simon Peter, Peter said, Master, you wash my feet? Jesus answered, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but it will be clear enough to you later on. Peter persisted, you're not going to wash my feet ever. Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you can't be a part of what I'm doing. Master, said Peter, not only my feet then, wash my hands, wash my head. Jesus said, if you've had a bath in the morning, you only need your feet washed now and you're clean from head to toe. My concern, you understand, is holiness, not hygiene. So now you're clean, but not every one of you. He knew, he, was, he knew who was betraying him. That's why he said, not every one of you. And after he had finished washing their feet, he took his robe, put it back on, and he went back to his place at the table. And then he said, here's what I want you to hear. Do you understand what I have done to you? You address me as teacher and master, and rightly so, that is what I am. So if I, master and teacher, washed your feet, you must now wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. A servant is not ranked above his master. An employee does not give orders to the employer. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. It was more than just washing feet. Because again, like here's what's crazy. When they walked into that upper room that night, I'm pretty sure somebody had already washed their feet. So their feet weren't really that gross. That's a tradition. That's what happens normally in a Jewish household. You walk into a place, your sandals are coming off, you're washing your feet, then you're going to go sit with your guests. Jesus is doing it a second time because he wants them to see that nobody, master, leader, president, dictator, company owner, CEO, none of us is greater than Jesus, son of God. And if the son of God will do it for 
fishermen and sinners and tax collectors, then we ought to be doing it for everybody else. Jeter, Jeter, Jesus later on goes to say this in John 13, 34 and 35. Let me give you a new command, he says, love one another in the same way I have loved you. You love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the love you have for each other. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. They're not going to know us by the bumper stickers that we have. They're not going to know us by the little fish that we have on the back of their car. They're certainly not going to know us by the way we behave in traffic, right? They will only know what we believe if we express it by the way we love our neighbor. So do you look like a Christian most of the time? Do you look like you believe in Jesus by the way you live I hope that's the case. And don't get me wrong, I know we're all gonna mess up from time to time and sometimes we don't look like Jesus every moment that we're awake. But every day we should wake up and look ourselves in the mirror and say, today is gonna be better than it was yesterday. We need to be moving on towards perfection. You're welcome, Jeff Janes. That's a Methodist quote there. We have got to stop focusing on us and begin to shift our focus outside of us to others. And that's not simple, right? Luke chapter 6, 31 through 38 says, do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those that love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your, I'm sorry, love your, do good to them and lend to them without expecting to be, get, or sorry, to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. What a great way to end church this morning. Clearly, when we do the things that Jesus asks of us, it says a good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured out into your lap. We shouldn't serve others to receive a blessing, but it's good to know that there's a promise that we will be blessed when we do. So church, let's not just follow the example that that Jesus has for us or the the commands of Jesus to tell us that tells us to go and do likewise let's hear the promise at the end of the scripture that when we give to others when we serve others that when we do for others we're going to be blessed and here's what's key when we are blessed we become a blessing to other people right we should never stop when we like, okay, I've been blessed. God has done something great for me. All right, yay, me. No, no, no. That's just refilling us so we can go and do something even greater for the kingdom. Let us remember this particular scripture, these stories, always, so that we can better serve Jesus as he has served us. Let our vows of the church continue to weigh on our hearts so that we as people who call ourselves Methodist can continue to better our world through the way that we serve others. This day and always. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the gift of Jesus, the example that he sets for us on how we should love and serve others 
God, it gives us something to reach for. Help us, God, to follow the example of Jesus every day that we live. God, even when we get, uh, when we, even when we get it wrong, break our hearts so that we recognize the next time an opportunity presents itself to us, we can try harder, do better to live as you've commanded. God, we thank you for blessing us when we bless others. But God, here and now, we just, we claim that those blessings you give us will be used to give more, to love more, to serve more. God, we love you so much and we're so thankful. We're so thankful that we have a community that's seeking to change the world, to look more like the kingdom that Christ promises us. God, help us to recognize the hurting and the broken and help us to give and to serve at all times. Lord Jesus, as we close out this morning, continue to move in our hearts and draw us closer to you so that when we leave this place, we'll be equipped and prepared to bring about the kingdom of God here and now. Lord Jesus, we love you. And all these things we've done today, we do in your name and for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on today's Community Cast. We hope that you were blessed by today's conversation. If you'd like to know more about Community Brookside, please feel free to visit us at our website, communitybrookside.com, or find us on your favorite social media outlet. We hope to hear from you soon. Be blessed.